there are a handful of strength categories that we think really matter and, and just ideas that are important when you think about strength. So one of them is the importance of understanding eccentric versus concentric strength and how both are very important. I actually put something up on Instagram the other day about this where I you know, just explained that the concentric phase is basically the go and the eccentric phase is the slow. So you accelerate through concentric force which is the force a muscle generates as it is shortening. That moves you forward. The eccentric phase, which is equally important but oft ignored, is the strength or the force that a muscle is exhibiting as it is lengthening. That's what's decelerating. That's what's slowing you down. Andy Galpin, I think, recently talked about a great metric, and I agree, this is a fantastic metric, something, you know, I'll, I'll check mine constantly is how far a broad jump can you do? So I want to make sure that I can do a standing broad jump that's higher than my height laying down. So, you know, if I'm five foot 10, I want to make sure I'm jumping at least six feet on a broad jump. And a broad jump is a really interesting test. It's a profoundly extreme example of concentric and eccentric strength in the same movement. If you're just standing there and you want to jump six feet in front of you, that requires an enormous explosion. That's a very high concentric load. But guess what? If you want to not break your nose when you land and destroy your knees, you better be able to decelerate yourself and slow yourself down. That's an unbelievable eccentric ask. So while that's a very extreme example, consider walking up and down stairs. Walking up the stairs is very taxing concentrically. But where do most people get hurt in life? It's actually walking downstairs. And if you watch, especially as people age, the difficulty they have in slowing themselves down when they're coming downstairs or taking a step off a curb, this is where people are falling and breaking their hips. It's far less that they're falling due to concentric weakness and far more that they're falling due to eccentric weakness. So therefore, principle number one in our strength training is always be doing both. Not necessarily in the same movement, not necessarily focusing equally on a given day, but everything we want to do, we want to make sure that we are hitting the concentric and the eccentric phase, not just mm -hmm. the more obvious, which is the concentric. Now, does that take the form of simply accentuating the lowering in the case of say a trap bar deadlift or something like that, where you have something like two seconds up, four seconds down, or does it take other specific forms? There are very specific exercises that you'll do. So for example, like a, you know, a Nordic rollout, you know, a Nordic fall, you know, for a hamstring exercise where you're, mm -hmm. you know what I'm talking about when you're kneeling on a mat and your feet are held in position and you sort of allow yourself to slowly come down. That's just purely yeah. eccentric misery. Requires quite a bit of starting strength to do. <laughs> well, and, and truthfully, we wouldn't have people do that out of the gate. You'll do that with assistance to start because most people simply don't have the hamstring strength to do that. Yes, it can be accomplished greatly by using slow, what we call negatives. Mm -hmm. So focusing just as much on the negative as the positive. So for example, one of my favorite exercises to do are step-ups because one, it's a single leg exercise. It's a beautiful hip hinge. And we can talk about it in some detail in a moment because hip hinging is another one of the big principles and it allows you to do a very nice isolation of the eccentric on the step down mm. and you really have to be able to control that if you can't control it you're using too much resistance obviously so hip hinging is another big important principle mm -hmm. and again hip hinging when people think about that they think that does that have to be a squat or a deadlift no it doesn't have to be it can be a hip thruster it can be a lunge it can be a step up i mean i think the step up might be the single most important one for people to do because it doesn't have any axial loading could you explain what you mean by that when you're doing something like a squat or a deadlift by you there's there's weight that is basically pulling your spine down to your hips Mm -hmm. In the squat, it's because the weight is actually sitting there. In the deadlift, it's because the weight is being, the force is being transferred through your arms there. But in either case, you are loading the axis of your spine. And that's fine if you know how to do it safely. But as you know, you know, having done these things, like that's not just something you can walk in off the street and do. You really have to be coached how to do that stuff safely. And, you know, stepping up onto a block 
is something that's much safer to do. Mm -hmm. And it's also something that you can do with a single leg at a time. And therefore you get to see what your asymmetries are because we all have them. I mean, I am so deep down the rabbit hole of step ups that I can't even like explain the nuances in oblique compression, pelvic angles in the difference between when my left and right leg do it. But it, you know, tinkering with that stuff allows me to work out so many kinks with, with how my body works. You mentioned another one earlier, which is being able to carry heavy things. You know, this is just such an essential skill for our species. It's something that we do better than anything. There is no animal that can carry with their hands what we can do. Certainly a strong male, but even a strong female can carry their body weight in their hands. You know, half their body weight in each hand is not, is not an insurmountable ask for us. Would that be a hypothetical target for your patients? Yeah, we would like to see our patients carry half their body weight in each hand for a minute. For a minute. So walk around with half your body weight in each hand for a minute. Yeah. And having strong hands is, you know, it, it's, it's one of the most correlated findings with longevity. So we talked earlier about like, what does it mean to be really, really strong? Well, unfortunately, the data on this are based on what the studies show. And the studies are testing, you know, interesting things, but they're not exhaustive, right? So they're usually looking at grip strength, leg extension, bench press are the most commonly tested things. But grip strength comes up over and over and over again in studies as such a proxy for longevity. You know, lower risk. I think there's a figure in, in my book that talks about the unbelievable monotonic decline in both the risk of onset of dementia and death from dementia as grip strength increases. Hmm. Again, just kind of go back to the Bradford Hill criteria and you look at the strength of the associations, you look at the consistency of these associations you look at the dose effect of these associations it's very hard for me to believe that there isn't causal relationships here and that being stronger training to be stronger will actually improve outcomes not just that strength is a marker of health which is obviously correlated with living longer if that makes sense yeah there's a distinction there so yeah we think that carrying things is very important yeah, I'll, I'll go through different phases. As you know, I love rucking. So that's another thing that I think is just a great all-around way to kind of now combine two different types of exercise, something that's part of strength and something that's part of endurance. So just for people who don't know, rucking is just basically carrying a really heavy-weighted backpack. Probably one of the most important tools used in the training of special forces in the military. I mean, you know, you, we have so many friends that have been through that and, and it's, I'm amazed at how much they rucked. Like it's yeah. sort of like, Eight hours a day. They're just walking around with 75 pounds on their back, if not more. What does your protocol methodology look like for rucking? So I use 55 to 60 pounds and I'll typically do an hour ruck. And because of where I live, it's really hilly. So I really like that. Going up the hills, I'm going hard. You know, I'm really pushing my cardio up the hills and I'm trying to find the steepest hills possible to come down because that's working that huge eccentric gear. It's really forcing me to be able to decelerate on the way down those hills with a lot of weight. And you're not getting the pounding. I mean, I think that's the beauty of it, right? Is you're not pounding your knee with the impact you would if you had to run to produce that effect. 